At the end of the last ice age, vast sheets of ice began to retreat north across the northern hemisphere. As they melted, great rivers and glaciers formed at their bases. These rivers and glaciers left certain recognizable erosion patterns as they flowed away from the ice sheets. These patterns could be found consistently on all of the continents of the northern hemisphere. Yet, in a certain area of the state of Washington, known as the Channeled Scablands, erosion patterns did not fit the standard models. This region baffled geologists for decades until one man was able to explain their secrets. In the process, he would make powerful enemies and undo over a century of accepted scientific theory. Beginning in the late 18th century, scientists began to think of the forces shaping the world as being gradual and taking incredibly long periods of time to affect the environment. These forces were constant and in action in a uniform manner everywhere in the universe since the beginning of time. This concept was called uniformitarianism. The idea came from a great geologist, James Hutton, during the Scottish Enlightenment of the late 18th century. What James Hutton determined was the natural forces causing the mountains to rise out of the oceans, creating the land, have been steadily at work since the world began. He postulated these forces are slow, gradual, never changing, and will continue to work in the same fashion forever. There's no vestige of a beginning, no indication of an end. That's the process of uniformitarianism. In a short time, Uniformitarianism became the accepted theory among geologists. Yet there are places on Earth where this uniformitarian theory doesn't seem to fit. One such place is an area of eastern Washington state called the Channeled Scablands. As the Ice Age ended and the ice sheets across the northern hemisphere retreated, outflowing rivers and glaciers left behind a system of drainage valleys flowing away from their bases. Valleys created by rivers have V-shaped cross-sections, while those created by glaciers are U-shaped. But valleys in the Channeled Scablands region have rectangular cross-sections with flat valley floors and steep canyon walls. In 1922, a geologist named J. Harlan Bretz came into the region to study these odd valleys. J. Harlan Bretz was a classic field geologist very observant, capable, and very hardworking. His tools were his feet and his eyes, his notebook, and his brunt and compass. He walked the land and he mapped the land. Brett's groundwork led to a unique discovery about the Scablands. When he mapped the land and put it on paper, he could see patterns that were only analogous to streams that have braided channels and are of a much smaller scale, hugely smaller scale. What he was seeing was so huge, it was just unbelievable to everybody but him. Bretz presented his information for the first time in 1923 at a meeting of the Geological Society of America in Washington, D.C. And there were a number of very prominent geologists there. He presented it openly, honestly, fairly, and his ideas just simply were not accepted. No one had ever mapped that area in the kind of detail he did, and no one thought that a stream could be that big and cause the erosional features like he saw. They weren't receptive to what he was showing them on the maps. It had to do mainly with their own understanding of the world and how it works, and their own receptiveness to new ideas. The geologists in charge of the GSA were devoted to the uniformitarian model of how natural laws worked. This would not permit them to believe a catastrophic flood of such scale could occur. So he fell out, and he was ostracized about it. But this was not the end for Bretz. For years, turning to decades, he returned to the Scablands and continued to collect data supporting his claim. 
He continued to present his data to the GSA, who in turn continued to reject his hypothesis. I doubt that any person is immune to rejection by their own profession. I mean, I, I'm sure that must have been a very painful thing. But what Bretz did was what he knew how to do. He was the only one that had walked all those miles. He is the only one that mapped it. He is the only one that knew where there needed to be more data, and that's what he did. He just built his case. As Bretz collected his data, one big piece of the puzzle was still missing. Where did the water come from that would cut those big channels? Because it had to be big. If it's big, where's the evidence? And nobody knew the evidence at that time, with the possible exception of J.T. Pardee. J.T. Pardee had been working in western Montana at roughly the same time as Brett's in eastern Washington. Pardee was at the meeting and years later recognized things in Montana that related directly to the channel scab lands in eastern Washington. What Pardee saw were things like gigantic ripple marks. If you look at a stream or if you look along the beach, you can see how the water makes little ripples. These in western Montana are huge. And there are other things. If you go to the town of Missoula and look at the hills around the city of Missoula, then you can see what amounts to bathtub rings marching up the sides of the hill. Now what you have from the work of Pardee is that you have a huge lake in western Montana all the way back further to the east from Missoula. So we're standing here along the Clark Forks River before it flows into Missoula, Montana. Where we're standing now, we would have been underneath about 900 feet of water. And you can see evidence of that from the rocks behind us here in these hills. The gray, the dark rocks at the bottom of the hills are the basement rocks, the Precambrian metamorphic or metasedimentary rocks. Above that, at the top of the hill, the more buff-colored rocks, those are silts. And those silts built up to about 300 feet thick. This is a huge scale of a thing. Now the stage was set. There's evidence of a huge lake in the area of Missoula, Montana, and evidence of a huge flood in eastern Washington. But what could have caused the lake to form in the first place, and then drain all at once? Working out the geological history of that area, what it boils down to is there was an ice dam on the Clark's Fork River. Evidence shows glaciers coming off the retreating North American ice sheet filled the Clark's Fork River Valley to a height of several hundred feet. As river water from further upstream filled the valley behind the glaciers, pressure at the bottom increased. As the lake filled and pressure built, the water began to heat up. The heat and pressure eventually became so great it melted the ice faster than it could be replaced by the glacier's advance. Eventually, the ice dam was breached at its base, allowing it to collapse completely. When that ice dam broke, it released so much water that it swept through eastern Washington, scoured the prairie off, and cut down into the volcanic rocks of the Columbia Plateau that formed the basement there, and finally ending up going out through the Willamette Valley in Oregon to the sea. It just created havoc, a situation downstream that created a landscape that you will not find anywhere else in North America. The force of these waters reached their climax in an area of the Scablands called the Staircase Rapids. This is probably the place, the, all the Scablands, where the floodwaters went the fastest. It's about 75 miles an hour. These are streamlined Palouse Hills. If you were above them, you'd see they're shaped like a bullet. The water came on both sides, veered around them, and then shot on down the hill. The water coming down here hit the Palouse River so hard and pushed against the hills over there that it went above them and started dripping over and then carved a hole and that changed the route of the Palouse River. The Palouse River now goes through a canyon 
and then drops over a 200 foot falls and then it goes through another canyon until it enters into the Snake River. After researchers established Lake Missoula had formed because of an ice dam on the Clarks Fork River and the damage across the Scablands was due to its collapse, evidence indicated something even more incredible. Recent work has shown that the Clarks Fork River was dammed more than once. You can look in eastern Montana and you can actually trace how the lake fills. You can see varves, minute laminae. This is a laminated sample of sediment from the bottom of the lake. It's made up of rock flour. It's the size of a mineral a clay ground up by the glaciers, recording year by year how long the lake was there and then flooded away 36 times in this outcrop. It's believed Lake Missoula may have filled as many as 40 or more times. With the ice dam forming, the lake filling, and the dam breaking roughly every 50 years. That means the channeled scablands were formed over the course of around 2,000 years. So you had it building up and the dam bursting and this process happening several times. It really boggles the mind. With mounting evidence, the Geological Society of America had to publicly recognize Brett's research. Finally, in 1979, over 50 years since he had first proposed his Scablands flood theory, the GSA did just that. It was years and years and years, actually just before he died, that he was given the Penrose Medal by the Geological Society of America for his contributions to geology, for doing all the field work, and his persistence and his suffering at the ostracism of his colleagues. J. Harlan Bretz passed in 1981 at the age of 98. But he died a venerated man. He was able to convince the geological establishment to abandon its strict uniformitarian interpretation of natural laws and embrace one that allowed for catastrophic events. All scientists today recognize that there are certain general principles and processes that are just simply empirical. They will happen, and they will happen in a certain way. But you can have constellations of empirical events that manifest themselves in huge catastrophes. The ramifications of Brett's accomplishments have spread well beyond earthbound geology. What J. Harlan Bretz did now affects the way we look at the whole solar system, the way we look at the presence of water on other planets, the way we look at what water can do on other planets. You can see these huge braided channels on Mars. J. Harlan Bretz made one of the greatest contributions to geology of the 20th century, and his contribution will go on as long as we explore our universe. Mm -hmm.